Greetings all, we are going to change gears just a little bit and instead of the usual in-depth detail stuff, we're going to go back to write simple basics. And we're going to call this Tanks 102. Tanks 101, if you will recall, was about an hour long. And it gives you some very basic ideas of principles of how a tank works and how one is designed. So now with the aid of a couple of models, I'm going to show you how to name various parts of the tank. And we're going to start off with tank and not a tank. I went over that in Tanks 101. But because the Navy was basically the guys that developed the tank, at least in the English language, a lot of the terminology that he used is naval base. So the entire bottom half of the tank is the hull of the tank. And the turret, of course, well, battleships have had turrets for a very long time. On the sides here, we have sponsons. Out in the front, we got the bow. You don't have the stern though, you just got the back end of the tank. Don't know why. Back here, you got the deck, engine deck. Glassy, glacy, glacis, all sorts of different ways of pronouncing it. I'm sure one of them is correct. We just call it the front slope. Simple terminology there. All right, so going into a little bit more detail so you will have obviously fuel filler ports i've shown them on my videos you know what they are side skirts they're usually numbered so number one is at the front and then two three four five six seven however many you have also known sometimes as bazooka plates especially with the british just immediately after world war ii sprocket wheel at the back and the sprocket wheel is almost every single tank out there with a few minor exceptions such as the bt such as the t-34 where for simplicity's sake they are still called sprocket wheels even though they don't have teeth and they're not really a sprocket instead they are probably more accurately referred to as drive wheels bits of the track of course you got single pin and double pin well that basically is how many shafts come all the way through one side of the track pin to the other the m1 has a double pin track the let's say m113 has a single pin sherman's have a double pin panzer 5 the panther has a single pin if you have a single pin track it's easy because you just have one track link into meshes with the other if you got double pin track well then you need to have end connectors which are the little bits on the end which are and basically they hold the two pieces of track link together and those are held in place usually by means of a wedge bolt which just kind of keeps the whole end connector thing in place you also have center guides or guide horns so for an american tank like this for example you got center guides if you look at a sherman now that i think about it i have one around here somewhere ah, grab this heavy bugger so for the sherman you can see that the guide horns, this early model, are on the outside of the, of the tracks as opposed to the center guides, or let's say on a HVSS system, they go on the inside. Uh, the reason I'm doing this with models, by the way, is I'm too lazy to actually go look up pictures and start pointing at, you know, arrows or whatever on them. All right, so then you have live track, dead track, supported track, unsupported track supported track while well, you got return rollers underneath which well let's grab the sherman again we have return rollers on the bogies unsupported track is something like a t54 or t34 where it just rolls down and you know rolls on the main road wheels often known as Christie suspension it is wrong you, you'll see this in you know uh, occasional army afvid classes so oh, it's got Christie suspension because it rolls down it doesn't have return this isn't correct dry track versus lubricated track and lubricated track is awful because that means that every single track link joint has a uh, has to be oiled and how often you have to oil it can be irritating so I, I, I'm gonna bring, bring up at some point a video um, with a German half track and every single link has a bolt that you got to undo it's, it's terrible live track or dead track dead track is the simplest sort of thing that um, uh, it, it's like the shaft goes right through a hole and there's nothing else live track there's actually rubber bushings there's, go, there's a sort of a, a little spring in the track uh, it 
it's a little bit more complicated, shall we say. All right, so then you got all the road wheels, got road wheel hubs. Then they, of course, have to be lubricated. Road wheels on the M1, they're two pair. So if we look at the spare part, for example, you see one road wheel is half of the pair. Now, if you look at, let's say, a T55, you'll see that the things are basically permanently welded together. So it makes it a little bit more difficult to, to change out. I mean, uh, it is possible, I wouldn't recommend it, but it is possible for a single person to pick up one of these road wheels. Not so if you're talking about maybe a steel road wheel or especially not one of those major ones like the T55. Moving further forward, of course, you got the, uh, actually not so much further forward, still sticking on the wheels. You got the different types of suspension, torsion bar, Christie, uh, bogey, uh, coil. The, the, there's all sorts out there. If you watch my videos enough, you probably should know them, but just in case. Moving further forward, you have the idler, sometimes also known as the compensating idler because this is the wheel at which the tension is usually placed for the track. I always talk about track tension and there's a reason for it because if you don't do it, your track falls off. If your track falls off, you're gonna have a bad day. There is often a connector between the idler and the first road wheel that as one road wheel goes up, the idler is pushed forwards and backwards and it maintains the tension on the track over uneven terrain. Not all vehicles have it, a lot do. Coming further forward, we've got where the tow hooks mount and the headlights. So I'm just going to rotate this around. On the M1, the headlights are a little bit annoying. You have to actually switch out the lenses if you're going to do night driving, at least when you had the infrared night driver. Uh, when they later moved to the thermal imager, I don't think that uh, that's an issue anymore. Uh, other vehicles will have a separate headlight for night driving and daylight driving. Front of the gun here, the muzzle reference sensor. And this started showing up more or less with Chieftain, give or take. It's a, it's a little tube. It's the only radioactive part on the tank, at least on an American tank. And what there is, there's a little bit of glow in the dark, radium or aluminum, whatever it is, tritium. And uh, at night, you can actually see this thing. And what it does is it tells the computer, or at least it tells you, where the end of the gun tube is compared to your sight. So before you get going, you do something called bore sighting. And at the simplest uh, level, bore sighting is making sure that the gun is pointing the same place that the sight is pointing. Easiest way of doing that is you pick a target, say a kilometer that way, you aim the gun at the target, you aim the sight at the target, and hopefully the two will match. Now you then have to go through a little bit more detail, but that's the very fundamental. These days you get a muzzle bore sight device. It's a telescope, it sticks in to the, uh, sticks into the gun tube, and you look in through an eyepiece at whatever the target is. It's got a little crosshair, you place it very, very precisely on the target. Interestingly, if you go to the wiki page, I should hopefully put up a picture now, um, the TC, that's one of my tanks actually on the wiki page. It's uh, st then Staff Sergeant Adam Gorey uh, looking in the uh, uh, looking in the site, and so you set them up. You align the gun to your target first, so you know what way the gun is pointing. Then you adjust the primary sight to the target. You will then do the auxiliary sight. Now the auxiliary sight, this uh, is the uh, coax shroud. The auxiliary sight is a little hole which should be visible and apparently may not be on this model, but it's on the right hand side. It's literally, it's a simple backup telescope that's nice and low and then you, you side all three of them together, which is fantastic. So you do that every day theoretically uh, before you go out and your shots should land where you aim them. Uh, and don't forget also, you gotta bore sight the night vision as well. It's, it's not all that simple. Now, this is all very well and good once you got yourself going in the morning. But as soon as you fire around, uh, which is a very impactful in, uh, incident on the vehicle, because you, know, you see the 70 ton tank rocking after, after a single round is fired. After a couple of those, things start getting perhaps a little bit out of alignment, either because the, the gun warms up, so you're not shooting cold bore anymore, you're shooting warm bore, uh, or you know, just a vibration, something gets loose. After a few rounds, you want to make sure that that is still aiming where you want it to. 
So you'll find uh, there's a process and the Abrams, it is a manually done process, not necessarily so on other vehicles, that you have to move the sight head uh, to an MRS update position. So you actually flip a physical lever and it physically moves the mirror. Instead of aiming downrange, it is now aiming at the muzzle reference sensor. You then adjust with your little uh, buttons or joystick, I can't remember what it is off the top of my head, to make sure that the MRS is actually back on top of uh, the crosshair. That is updated the position of the gun tube to the side, flip the mirror back out, and away you go. Takes you yeah, maybe 10 seconds or so. So it's not a huge amount of time. Now, later tanks, they've come up with other ways of doing it. For example, if I recall correctly, the Chinese tanks, uh, what they do now with the Type 99, is there is a computer that tracks the trajectory of the projectile through the gun sight, and it matches it up with where the crosshair was. So if it realizes that it's off, well, uh, that's, that's how they fix it. Now, this is, of course, not the only thing that will affect the accuracy of the gun over time. Now, what you can't see here, uh, at least not easily, is the thermal shroud over the gun tube. And it's a lot more easy to see, let's say, on a British Chieftain or Challenger because it's very obviously just canvas wrapped around the gun tube. Thermal shroud, what it does is it equalizes the temperature of the gun. Now, at its most basic concept for you, and it does more, but a very, very simplest thing to give you an idea of why this thing is important. Imagine you're out in the middle of the desert. It's 110 degrees. You're, you're out in Fort Hood or something, and you're shooting away. And... After a while, your gun tube, say four or five rounds, your gun tube gets a little bit warm. What happens to the metal when it gets warm? It expands. Okay, so when it expands, the gun tube is going to change shape just a little bit. Maybe not much because it's an even expansion. Now, let's say the next thing that happens is a rainstorm comes along. Very sudden rainstorm dumps two minutes of rain on the top of the gun tube. It has now cooled the top of the gun tube. The bottom of the gun tube is still hot. What's going to happen is that the top of the, the metal on the top of the gun tube will contract and up will aim the gun. Now again, this can be somewhat compensated for by the MRS, but why add to the difficulties? So by shielding and shrouding the gun tube, you've now eliminated some of that effect. Now there's more to it. So for example, again, you're in the desert, the sun comes down, it beats off of the, uh, the sand, reflects on the bottom of the uh, gun tube as well as one side of the gun tube so it, the, the gun kind of almost does a figure eight or a W if you, if you leave it alone and don't do anything. Next thing back here is the uh, fume extractor or bore evacuator. Uh, in American it's called the bore evac, in British it's the fume extractor. There are no moving parts in this thing and if you look inside underneath the uh, bore evacuator, if you were to take it off, you will see that there's simply a small amount of holes in the gun tube that are angled somewhat forward. So you fire around, and of course you've got all the high pressure, hot propellant gases which are shooting around out. Gets to about here, and now all these high pressure gases are start to seep into the bore evacuator through the holes in the gun tube. So you now have high pressure gas in the bore evacuator, in the reservoir, which is, it's a big, huge, empty space. Well, I say big, huge, it's not actually that big, but it is big enough. The ramp continues its way at the end, and all of a sudden now you have an open end at one end, you got a closed end because the breach hasn't opened yet, and you got high pressure in the reservoir. Well, what's gonna obviously happen is that the gas in the high pressure reservoir is going to start seeping out to the low pressure area of the gun tube at the front, and to try to equalize the pressure. As it does this, it creates a sort of a forward momentum. By this time, the gun has recoiled, the breech block is dropped, and the shell casing has been extracted, or the aft cap in, in the case of this 120. So you now have a hole at the back, a hole at the front, and high pressure gas moving this way, which is now going to start sucking the air or the gas that is back here, the propellant fumes, and will come out the end. So if you take a close look at the tank once it fires, you'll see the shot, big huge explosion, then about a half a second later, you are going to see 
another puff of smoke and that's this thing operating and as I say there's no moving parts in this at all now there are other ways of doing it look at a French vehicle let's say Leclerc or AMX 30 there's no uh, fume extractor at all and that's compressed air so you know, it goes back as far as Panther and there is a physical air reservoir and pump that says okay we're not gonna blow air at the end uh, but it's a lot easier than relying on an extractor fan on the top of the turret to, to stop your crew from choking to death uh, other ways of making sure that the, the vehicle is like, so at the back here, the crosswind sensor, I've mentioned it before in another video, which does not need to be warmed before operation. It's very simple. It tells the tank, okay, the wind is coming this way. And so again, here's a, here's a little bit of food for thought. You're firing a Sabre round, uh, armor piercing, fin stabilized, discarding Sabre. That way. The wind is coming this way. Which way would you aim the dart to compensate for the wind? And most people will say, well, the wind is coming this way, so obviously you aim it into the wind and the round will ascribe an arc. It'll go out that way and then it'll get blown this way. That's not what happens with a fin round. If you look at a fin round, you've got the shape of the round and then you've got big, huge fins at the back. The wind is coming sideways at it which means that it will grab the back of the round and push it. So when you're looking at it from the front, what's actually gonna happen is you're gonna fire with the wind, wind comes sideways, pushes the round, which will then curve around to the left. So important uh, to note what kind of round you're firing and which way the wind is going, how fast the wind is going. When you're doing the bore sighting, one of the other things you do is you plug into the computer what the barometric pressure is, because hey, different air densities will have different effects. There is a thermometer in the bustle. You look at the thermometer and you tell the ballistic computer that the temperature of the ammunition is this because it affects the time. They think about this a lot. <coughs> um, other parts. Uh, all right, I've mentioned the doghouse, also known as the gunner's primary site housing, but everybody just calls it a doghouse. Smoke grenade launchers, these are the British type. There is also you know, American type, obviously, as well. The Marines would use those. Uh, stowage bins, the blow-off panels on the back of the tank. Now, if you uh, are unlucky, I mentioned that these little items here on the top, they were for a ammunition, a quick ammunition replacement system. A crane will come along, latch onto these three things on the top, and it'll pull out the entire ammo rack set it aside, the empty ammo rack, and then pick up a full ammo rack and put it back in. Obviously, it was never really entered service. In fact, it only really entered service at all. And so if you want to load the 42 rounds of ammunition, you got to go through the loader's hatch to do it. CWS, the Commander's Weapons Station. Uh, I, it's caliber 50 remote control from down inside, although obviously the other versions of tanks will have simple flex mount, same with the skate ring. Uh, the bustle and the bustle rack. Uh, the bustle is an old word. It's basically the sticky out bit on the back of a woman's dress way back in the day. Not a female version of a cod piece or something. I don't know what it is. Um, but they kept the word for the sticky out bit on the back of the turret. Easy as. All right, something else I forgot to mention at the front because the M1 doesn't have one. But the Bradley here does have one. And it's even easier to see. Oh, there went my, uh, there went the, uh, the mud guard. It's easier to see on this Panzer Haubitzer. And that is the device at the end of the gun tube. On both of these vehicles, it is a muzzle brake. It is not the same necessarily as a blast deflector. A muzzle brake will reduce the recoil of the round because what it does is it deflects the gases backwards so it effectively pushes the, uh, the gun forwards as the recoil is pushing backwards. They tell me when I was doing the Bradley course that the uh, muzzle brake on the front of the Bradley knocks about 15% off of the recoil force. It's not too bad, all things considered. If the tank is big enough and heavy enough and you've got a good long recoil system, 
uh, then you don't need a muzzle brake. Because the problem with it is that it creates all sorts of smoke and obscuration. The, the blast comes back, it lifts up the dust, it makes you a lot more visible, and it also obscures your ability to see the opposition. Or better yet, wherever it was that you land, uh, that your round landed. A blast deflector is not so much concerned about reducing the recoil, but what it is concerned about is deflecting the gas sideways or maybe upwards to stop the whole creating a cloud of dust effect. Usually one of these things is actually a muzzle brake, especially with modern tanks where the guns are just so strong and so powerful that you know, uh, a blast deflector is basically just you know, a, a pointless, futile exercise. Uh, another little item on here is, if I don't miss my guess correctly, these are sensors which determine the velocity of the outbound round, just to, again for further accuracy, all the, all the updates you can possibly imagine. All right, other important things. So poor buggers on the Panzer Haubitz, they, they look like they have a lovely large deck, but it got screwed up. On the Abrams, you sleep on the back deck here, if you can, or up on the top. You've got lot, lots of room here, lots of room on the front slope. It's a bit of an angle, you want to be careful. On the Bradley, first thing I did when I looked at this was ask where you sleep. And the answer basically is you put a little chalk block, a little block of wood under the rear deck, uh, rear ramp, lifts it up to about here, and uh, you have a nice flat section. It's great if you are the CEO because you don't have dismounts. If you do have dismounts, then there's a whole bunch of you fighting over who gets to sleep on that. Uh, but I would presume being riflemen, the dismounts will just sleep in the mud, and the, t the vehicle crew will sleep on the vehicle itself. Um, other items, so maintenance at the front of the tank. So we have, let's bring our Sherman back out again with our bogies. And you will see all the bolts at the front here uh, to remove the differential and access the transmission. Now, of course, these days we no longer do that. Uh, there has been a, there, there was a shift in the design of vehicle engines. Uh, more or less at the very end of World War II. So at the beginning or middle of World War II, let's say you had the engine would be at the back, you'd have the power shaft comes all the way to the front to the transmission here. British tanks didn't do that, Soviet tanks didn't do that, everything was at the back. And there were advantages and disadvantages to, to the way it works. Now in, in the end we determined that the amount of space that this power shaft took up was simply not worth it. Uh, so uh, we ended up that for two reasons uh, that, that will just make a single area which has all the powertrain in it. Those reasons are A, as I mentioned, space, and B, maintenance. When the M18 came out, uh, you'll notice that they had the big housing at the front for the access to the differential and the uh, transmission, and they also had the big access port at the back to the engines. They, this vehicle had rails that you can put in, I think the M24 did as well. They would mount these rails and instead of having to futz around with a crane and lifting off the engine deck and everything else, it would simply roll the, the engine out on rails and you can easily access it and if necessary, lift it out. You now lift out what is known as the power pack, which is not just the engine, but it is also the transmission differential. Everything basically from the combustion part to the getting to the final drives section. This would then be either at the back, let's say in an M1, or at the front, if it's, let's say, an M113, or in rare cases, like a Merkava. Uh, why would you put it at the front of an M113? Simply because if you put the engine at the back, you can't get out. And if you look at some vehicles that were like that, um, BTR, for example, the BTR does not have a back ramp simply because that's where the engine is. So instead people get out the side or over the top. Uh, whereas if you look at the, uh, let's say the Czech, it was, it was a Polish Czech uh, APC OT, was it the OT64? I, I, I need to look it up. Uh, they have the driver's compartment at the front, the engine is in the middle, and then the crew compartment is at the back for the troops with a ramp that you can get out the back. So by putting the engine at the front, you just made uh, a lot easier for everything at the back. Uh, but inside, the power pack is still the power pack. You, you, you lift up the front and the entire unit comes out as one block. Anyway, so hopefully that's uh, given you some ideas of how the various different parts of the tank work. Now, as you can see, I make scale, I make scale models. 
and there is probably nothing better for you to, to try to figure out as you're building a tank what each and every bit does that you're gluing on because you just think about it why is this here why does it exist there must be a reason for it and uh, if, if you are interested in trying to learn a little bit more about how and why a tank works or in fact anything at all that you're making i guess i'm not sure it works for formula one cars or anything else um that it's a good way of doing it as any so uh, i'm going to leave it at that for now if you've got any further questions about tank parts or bits and pieces uh, this is the outside i'm, I'm going to have to have a chew about how to do the inside of the vehicle i might end up using steel beast or something i don't know um to go over that but uh, for now that was tanks 102 outside bits <laughs>